Philip, back here, 40 Watt Podcast, getting ready for a great week ahead of us. Hope you're getting ready for the weekend uh, when this comes out and hope you're getting ready for, and maybe we'll talk about this a little today, uh, that pedal movie is coming out on uh, the day after this episode launches. So I'll be watching that. Um, hopefully we'll get to talk about that next week. I'm super excited about this episode this week. But before we get started there, I've got to tell you about all the things, get all the housekeeping taken care of. First and foremost, I want to welcome our newest Patreon, Christian, to the Patreon family. We sure appreciate your support. Uh, it helps us do these kinds of things. And uh, for those of you that also would like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com, 40 watt podcast, where for as little as $3 a month or for as much as however much you want to throw at me a month, uh, you can support and help us keep this content going. Uh, it covers for things like my hosting fees, my stream yard fees, those kinds of things. Uh, but also 25% of everything I net on Patreon goes towards uh, St. Jude uh, Children's Hospital. So that's a way for you to help a great charity as well as helping the podcast as well. Um, you can find us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash 40 watt podcast. We have a group. We have a page. You also find us on Instagram. I tend to be more active on Instagram than uh, Facebook. So if you want to reach out to me, you can Instagram message me or you can email me at 40 watt podcast at gmail.com. So now that I've got all those things out of the way, I'm going to get into um, what I think is a trademark term, some guitar nerdery. Uh, with Joe Branton of Polymath. I'm going to give his band credit first here, but also from the Guitar Nerds podcast. Joe, how are you, sir? I am good. I am good. Hello, Philip. Thank you very much for having me on an episode. And my goodness, crediting me with my band ahead of my podcast. That's, That's what it. should be done. I have this, oh. I have this take that I've been going on recently. Um, and while I, the podcast is fantastic, and that's how I found your band for sure. But um, I had this epiphany a few weeks ago i was i was uh, i was having a, i had an episode with ario posen and we were talking about as things start coming out of uh out of lockdown out of when gigs are happening again which is starting to happen i think you just announced a tour uh yeah. i think it's on social media uh you just announced a tour uh but i wanted musicians to kind of get better at complimenting other musicians and because it's something we're notoriously bad at <laughs> uh, we, we have a habit of complimenting people on gear before we compliment the music they make. Oh, yeah. I'm all about that. It's uh, <laughs> that's actually that's a great way of getting around complimenting a band that you're playing with if you don't like them. Knowing a lot about gear means you can be like, man, love that. Love that Line 6 DL4. You don't see many of those around anymore. Fantastic. Great use. Yeah. Great pedal. <laughs> that's exactly it. it. And sometimes we do it even when we really do like the music they're making. Like, cause we want to find a common ground. That's not just, I don't know. We, we think we're feeding ego or something. I don't know what it is anyway. So I start with the band first. Cause uh, I spent this morning, as I said, I'm uh, unashamed, you know, doing my research, listening to polymath. Thank you. Uh, it's pretty, pretty intense. Um, uh, it's for those of you that aren't aware, polymath is a progressive, math rock band would you call it that or just a prog rock band would you I guess try it's a, it's a prog band now it's kind of it's an interesting uh, you know I, I appreciate i'm going off tangent right at the start of this but it's an interesting kind of thing to separate because i think uh what happened was we were the math rock scene in the uk is is this scene kind of dominated by people in their sort of early mid 20s and uh, maybe some of them are getting a bit older now, but I think we were a, a little bit older. Like we were all in our sort of mid to late thirties. And when me and Tim, the guitarist started putting together polymath, we very much, the things we listened to were like King Crimson. Yes. The Mars Volta were probably our most, uh, you know, modern or current band. And I appreciate we're very similar to the Mars Volta. I know that's a major one for us, but, but nonetheless, like the, the, the thing that w that we wanted to do was prog. But at the time, there was this math rock scene in the UK. And I think people heard us and thought we were a math rock band. And math rock festivals were happening. Like, you know, prog festivals don't, you know, they only happen for the 50-year-old guys. And they're all the massive bands. And they're happen happening at the Albert Hall. You know, we're trying to play, you know, down at, you know, the sort of the 200-cap venue in Leeds. You know, it's... Right. It, is, it was a very different size thing. So it made sense for us to call ourselves Math Rock, even though 
we none of us really like or listen to math, math rock. I have loads of friends in math bands. They know I don't really like any of their music. Like it, math rock is uh, it's it's major scale tapping exercises, and I'm I'm not into that. But uh, it's always clean, and you know what clean sucks. So uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So so polymath is a prog band is the short answer to your first question. There you go. Polymath <laughs> is a prog band. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about that. It's really interesting. You bring up Mars Volta. I'm going to tangent to a cool story. Um, I am, I'm a, everyone who listens to the podcast knows I'm a blues, uh, roots, Americana kind of guy. It's what I do. Um, I was, I was in LA. We were playing a series of shows with my sister's band in Los Angeles. She was in talks, possible record deals and things. We were at sunset sounds there in LA. Um, uh, because we were working with a producer who was also producing a soundtrack and she had some musicians we knew. So we were just all hanging out. Um, so we're out in the courtyard because Sunset Sound ha has a couple of different studios. And so we're out in the courtyard just hanging out. A uh, guy comes out of one of the studios, kind of shoots the shit with us for a minute. And we're hanging out, like talk to him. And he's like, all right, got to go back to work. I was back in the studio. And one of my friends looked at me and said, do you know how that was? I was like, no. I was like, that's the drummer for the Mars Volta. <laughs> like, I, like, I wasn't in that scene you know i, I mean, I mean they had like four you know so it could yeah. it's, and it was yeah. early on, so i couldn't even tell you which one it was I, right. like what his name was but he was the drummer right after the mars volta was formed from the split of sparta is that correct right yeah uh yes yes yeah, sort of yeah there's yeah a, I, there's I, a bit I, of mud I, in between that but yeah. yeah you've got all of my understanding at this point so <laughs> literally that's all i have to interject about prog bands <laughs> well, that is very cool. That is very cool. You know, a lot of people would would argue their first drummer was their best one. I'm a more a Thomas Pridgen fan. Thomas Pridgen turned up for like the third and fourth record. Was he on the fifth? Was he on Octahedron? I can't remember. But uh, but yeah, he was uh, for me. He's he he was their best one. I mean, technically, he's the craziest, and I love that. Like, I think you know everything that happened afterwards with the Anthony Parks was very, very good. It was very progressive drumming, but I think it almost, it lost the point of the, the, the music, you know, there was a, he, he's very much one, like the Anthony Parks, the last drum of the Mars Volta is very much on or off and okay. he's very good, but it's just like, this song isn't going anywhere, but then maybe that was their songwriting around the time they were making Nocturnica as, as well. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. It, it, you know, I've got a buddy of mine. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's the same friend who pointed out the drummer of Mars Volta to me, who was really, really, really into Yes and really, really into Rush. And he would he would have me listen to these tracks all the time. And I was like, man, that's really awesome. And it's really um, almost cinematic in its in its, you know, in its composition. But at the same time, it was at that time, it was not something that I could find it like my my brain. I couldn't feel it. It wasn't happening like that. I don't know. Uh, I listen to it now and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? That doesn't make any sense. Now I get it. Um, yeah. And now, it, you know, it also makes sense, but now it doesn't make sense because I listen to what those guitar players do in like Life's and, and uh, was it How in Yes? Uh, it, it just ridiculous stuff they were playing. And so uh, Prague is starting to be a thing that becomes part of my vocabulary. It's as I get older, I'm doing that opposite of that most people think most people do. Most people get older and like the, the, they narrow the focus of the music they like and they start talking about the music they grew up with as if it was the greatest thing they ever heard. As I'm getting older, my musical like appreciation has broadened. That yes, that, that, that that's a that's a good way around to do it. I definitely think I did the same thing. You know, I kind of get like grew up in pop punk bands and stuff like that. So, you know, and uh and it, this is definitely a sort of a uh, blooming into actually listening to interesting music rather than you know a, a scene where people literally repeat the same three chords no matter what band they're in. Yeah, I there used to be in the in the little college town that I went to, uh, Cleveland, Mississippi. There was a it started actually in like an enclosed like alley space behind a frame shop. Uh, uh -huh. like there was this really interesting pop punk punk scene, hardcore scene happening there, like little like. 30, 40, 50 cap shows in an alley. Um, I used to go see a friend of mine's band, and I know Chad doesn't listen to this, but Chad was the uh, male guitarist in an all-girl hardcore band. Um, this is how they build themselves, um, called Sugar Biscuits. And 
they were fantastic. And that was like, it was a cool little scene until the IRS came knocking on the, to the frame shop. And when they, like, he filed his taxes and they said, well, what about the income from the concerts you put on behind the shop? And he was like, whoa, hold up. That's my kids. And like, that's like, they're just hanging out and doing, <laughs> so it had to move. And it became uh -huh. like shows at a farmhouse. It was a real cool, cool scene. Um, ne actually, never my style of music, but really awesome. Uh, it's uh, I love the you know the whole DIY scene. Math, math rock has a kind of a similar thing. I feel like it's like an evolution of punk rock anyway. But we have such a there are so many fantastic little DIY venues uh, in the UK that that I feel are a real like uh, punk rock has almost outgrown itself. Like Jay Cross, who I do the the Guitar Nerds podcast with, he's very much. Uh, he's very much a punk and he puts on a lot of punk shows and when I, whenever I go to those or or meet the people from that scene it feels like it's become a very safe middle class scene over here whereas math rock is is actually like you know that they, they are putting shows on in like abandoned uh, fruit and veg sellers in the part of Nottingham that's about to be knocked down you know that like there are actual shows like that and it's really good yeah. you get that really sort of sawdust on the floor kind of DIY DIY shows are the best you know the sort of show I mean you know they're not so great when you're touring with a sax player and a, and a keyboard player and the venue doesn't really have a PA that that can be a problem but you know <laughs> but I love I still love that I still love floor shows and you know but in polymath, I got through so many bases because I went through a stage of like trashing, trashing my gear at the end of. I mean, that sounds very pretentious, and actually, if anything, that's very middle class. You know, trashing, <laughs> a, trashing your guitar, isn't it? But I used to. I, I you know, know Pete Townsend made it work before they blew up. So. <laughs> yeah, true, true. As but, long as you um, put it back together and keep playing, you're fine. Exactly. Well, there you go. For 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 someone who who runs a podcast about guitars. My uh my main jazz bass that I use for polymath still has like duct tape around the top tuner because that you know it's sort of been <laughs> knocked off a couple of times. You know, we should get that fixed. Yeah, we've got like fifty <laughs> guitars. <laughs> fixed. <laughs> At some point, you have to stop saying it's a cost issue. You can you yeah. can afford new tuners. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, and yeah, so it's like it's even though it's not a scene, I've been like immersed in it's a scene i got little glimpses of at some point that's really really kind of cool and and like you said you know uh punk has kind of outgrown itself it especially once it went kind of mainstream in the 90s like hmm. it was there in in the late 70s and the 80s um but then in the 90s when pop punk happened it was like everyone it became mainstream to be edgy which doesn't yeah. really make sense but it that's is well, that's really well put yeah that's exactly what what it was yeah yeah, it's and so, ed edgy. And suddenly it was on all the major stages. Like I remember going to see um I went to see uh Matchbox 20 in the mid to early 2000s, right? Hmm. Uh, I love Matchbox 20. I'm unapologetic about it. I don't believe in guilty pleasures. Anyone that wants to give me shit about it, I don't believe in guilty <laughs> pleasures. You like what you like and get the hell over it. Um uh but like Matchbox 20 had Sugar Ray opening for them, which Sugar Ray, if you've only ever listened to the radio hits, you don't know anything about Sugar Ray. Like they're much more, they're much heavier in like their deep cut stuff. And they wanted to right. be, uh, they wanted to be a hardcore band, but then they wrote a couple of pop songs and that's what everybody wanted to hear from them. Uh, with American Hi-Fi opening before them, you know, which wow. was like this very, very edgy, but mainstream sort of, I wouldn't call them punk, but they were definitely on that fringier alternative side. And it's like really interesting to see these three bands together who really have nothing to do with each other. No. Yeah. That's quite a hybrid. That's the sort of, uh, it sounds like the sort of lineup put on by a radio DJ rather than anyone who's part of a scene sort of thing. I'm almost a hundred percent certain it was a radio DJ show. It was, I was <laughs> yeah, living in yeah. Murfreesboro. So it was in Nashville and you know, Nashville is Nashville. And yeah. as much as I love Nashville, there's there's as many cons as there are pros to Nashville. So, sure. So you've got this new tour. Talk about that. Since oh yeah, I literally just announced it yesterday before we recording. To we're recording on Tuesday. I don't mind telling people. I'm not going to try to you know make this ageless or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it, we uh, we actually record the Guitar Nerds podcast on a Monday, and uh, and like on on Monday at like. At, at six o'clock we start recording but we inevitably just chat for an hour and you know matt 
Matt's just going off on one talking about some new uh some new productivity thing his browser extension he's got I'm very bored so I'm like <laughs> uh just waiting for him to finish I'll just have a look I'll check oh, I haven't checked my band emails today I'll check those whilst Matt sort of finishes and I I, I check my band emails and there's like a our booking agent manager and like the guy from the other band are in a thread being like everyone ready for a 7 p.m launch for the tour announcement today yeah and that was sent like three three days ago and i'm like that's that's in five minutes and i'm currently podcasting so you know so anyone who's listening you know to the guitar Nets podcast from the week that when this was recorded yeah. I'm not really with it for the first 10 minutes because I'm trying to type like Facebook posts and like make a little banner to announce it and, uh, you know, uh, all of that stuff. So, so it was a rush, but yeah, you know, the UK is uh, hopefully on, on its way to opening back up. We'll see. I mean, there is a pin, this tour is announced, but we're like, it, a whole lot know, of fingers it, crossed. It's a whole lot of fingers crossed. And like, you know, we were announcing them all. We've got a show in Cardiff in Wales. Wales don't have a roadmap yet. So the the so the promoters in Wales are like, well, we'll book it, but we aren't promoting it. We're not putting any money behind it because Wales haven't even the, the Welsh government haven't even told us if we're gonna open yet. So it's very much like a October, I think, is the closest reasonable time a uh a tour could happen so we are we've got our fingers crossed that this will happen but yeah lovely to get back out in the in the uk and do a run i'm not sure how many days it is like six seven it's a good amount and we're hitting some really good um venues it's really nice to be headlining at all we always we almost always try and get on with kind of a larger band it makes sense to do that you know when you're at our level but it's nice to headline a tour and we've got a friend codices uh playing with us and they're a they're a they're a great kind of heavier math band so they fit the bill for for a, a run with us and it's our first tour with uh beth beth shalom well it's technically it's uh um it's let's stop hanging out booking agent which is the booking agent name of beth shalom record so it'll be our first our first tour with them which would be really good you know i i think they're they're wonderful and really proactive so we've been really happy with that so yeah, it's going to be nice. It's such a shame because, of course, this is our first post leaving the EU tour, and of course, normally we, we normally we'd be doing both, you know. And in fact, we're much more popular in in Europe, in mainland Europe, than we are here. Um, you know, we always sell more merch, make more money, play bigger venues, um, and of course, it's much bigger, so there are more places to play. And so it's a shame to have to isolate it to the UK, but everyone's kind of, well, st we can still go there, you know, if, 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 if you know, coronavirus diminishes and borders open, we could still go there, but no one's done it yet. So no one really knows what's going to happen. Like, are there going to be, are there going to be carnets? Are we going to have to, are we going to have to, are we going to be stopped at every border? Certainly, surely they're looking to make, you know, you know, make a, uh, an example of of a british band touring around in an obvious tour van you know like it's we we just every every band in the uk is sort of waiting for someone else to do it first mm -hmm. at the moment i think to find out what what's happening so then i, I don't want to wait the ice exactly exactly so I, I can't wait to get back over there because it's so much fun touring europe is the best like best time of my life they're always the best the best shows they're just the most you know they're always packed the 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 bookers for shows in mainland europe are consistently lovely you always get looked after so, like you'll never be looked after at a show like you will be in sort of mainland europe you know sort of almost germany especially their their hospitality for sort of organizing shows is is ast astronomically good they're even in comparison to the other incredible countries in europe so Oh, I can't. I just, oh, I'm making myself sad even talking about it. But <laughs> no, that that sounds incredible. And you know, I didn't mention it earlier, but I'm sure uh, Joe's dulcet tones have let you know that Joe is based out of England. And uh, if you, if you, those of you listeners that don't aren't familiar with Joe at this point, um, but I've got. So I've never been. I've never been to Europe. It's on my list. It it should have happened. There's multiple opportunities. It should have happened, but something or another came in the way. But I've got tons of friends that have toured europe uh they've played you know especially it, it's really interesting to me 
because again, I'm I'm primary. I grew up a blues musician uh, uh-huh. in Clarksdale, Mississippi. It's it's in the blood, you know, in the water. You can't escape it. You can try, but it just doesn't happen. Um, and lots of them, blues is so revered. Once you leave the American borders, it's really weird. Like over here, like I grew up and nobody appreciated it yet. And, and, and it happened even in, you look back in the 60s, it took um, English guitarists like Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page uh, all getting into the blues to make American listeners go, oh, but they're, they're playing the stuff we've had here for 50 years. It's weird that, isn't it? I've I've always thought that's a strange thing about the blues. Like, even when you think about like uh you know, one of my all time favorite bands are, are the Rolling Stones. Yes. And that even was, you bring them up. You think about like the faux American accents that were being thrown onto yes. stuff. And it's just like, this is so weird. Why are one of the biggest bands? I know they're not a blues band, but certainly like a, a lot of their stuff were blues tracks and it's like why are one of the biggest bands that make blues songs in the world english <laughs> well, this, this is gonna be this is gonna be crazy because I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna belie my like librarian upbringing i'm not gonna be able to cite the source but hopefully we, somebody can hunt it down and tell me where it is but i seem to remember an interview where mick jagger was quoted as saying we never set out to play rock and roll we were just trying to play American soul and blues music. That's what they were trying to do. And in failing, they made some of the most timeless rock and roll of all time. There you go. (laughs) It's wild. And so, in fact, there's a cool story. I told it on last episode. I'm really sorry for those hearing it again. Uh, You know, the Rolling Stones were the ones that started that trend of American blues bands going to Europe because they came over to Chicago and met with Willie Dixon, who was the one of the songwriters, producers at Chess Records in Chicago. And they set up to, like, they wanted to meet Willie Dixon and they wanted to start bringing blues musicians over for exposure in Europe. And it, it, that's exactly what happened. And so, yeah. and, and it's not just them. I mean, you look at, like, the Yardbirds. You look at, um, mm-hmm. I, go, 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 go. Uh, Paul Butterfield, you look at like there's a ton of others to to reference. I'm not going to try to go down that that rabbit hole because it's insane. It's a musicological nightmare trying to put all those ducks in a row. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting thing where like America completely neglected this wholly American art form, but then it it's almost like when a kid has a toy and they don't appreciate it, and somebody else comes around and wants to play with it. And then the yeah. kid suddenly it's like, oh no, that's my toy. I want to play with that. That's what we did with the blues. <laughs> that's exactly what we did with the blues. So um moving on a little from there though, and and but still talking sort of that route. Um, so on your podcast, you talk about this all the time, and, and I want to go down this rabbit hole with you because I've wanted to for a while, but the Facebook group is not the best best place. Uh by the way, y'all, there will be links down below for the guitar nerds Facebook group. Um, I will also put links for their podcast and for their Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter of the Guitar Nerds. It's it's some of the best money I spend every month. Um, uh, one, being able to listen to the episodes early and getting the extra content. Like the home recording series y'all are doing is really fantastic. Oh, uh, thanks, mate. Really enjoying that. I'm a Logic user, but you almost convinced me on, on Studio Bonus. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, but uh, you have unapologetically expressed your love for traditional old school style instruments. Like yeah. they don't necessarily have to be vintage, but you want them to be styled like the old ones, which is yeah. weird because you also tend to embrace things like plugins and helix and other newer technologies. Um, I am also an unapologetic traditionalist. Um, if you want to complain about a Les Paul weighing nine and a half pounds, maybe you should just play another instrument. Like that, just get over it. If you want a lighter Les Paul, you need a GTFO because <laughs> they are what they are. So, talk about that. That what what makes you like those vintage style instruments? Because you admit they have their flaws; they're harder to play. But what makes them so cool? Oh yeah, I um, yes, I think like a lot of it is you know I I do care a, 
I care a lot about the aesthetic and and I know obviously modern guitars have their own look and feel, but modern guitars for me have that look and feel like people who uh, or no, people who that that sounds like I'm attacking it. it <laughs> modern guitars have that feel like um, like a people who would think that a, a new pair of Adidas trainers are smart or that a new BMW doesn't look like some sort of dildo. Like it's, it's, it's those sorts of, uh, it's that thing, isn't it? It's like new smart. And I'm like, these things aren't smart. Smart is like an, a tweed suit, like a, an old pair of leather shoes. Like that's, that's kind of smart. Smart is a Hillman Imp Singer Chamois or like an old Mini or, you know, an Aston Martin. That's a smart car. And the same thing applies to guitars when you get to modern stuff. And yes, I, you know, I, I love things that make my life easier. I think it's weird, isn't it, that I like all the plugins and, uh, yeah. And 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 helix and stuff like that. I really get on with those things, but maybe I guess I've been burnt a few times live with pedal boards and stuff like that. So I tend to embrace kind of the the things that make my life easier there. But when it comes to a guitar, half of it is I want them to look cool. Like another big thing for me is, and I use cars as a reference, but uh, my my dad owns a classic car garage, and uh, and for me that that was that was like really something I was always brought up with was him imparting that that kind of exactly what i've just said don't new cars look rubbish and don't old old cars look absolutely fantastic listen to that old car yep fine it's got a manual choke but listen to this you know there's not an experience like driving this that was my 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 dad's view and i've applied that to guitars where i'm like fine i need two hands to move the tuner on on my uh which is true on my uh, on my Fender Music, my 1977 Fender Music Master Bass, but probably not going to need to tune it more than once in a set, so it's fine, you know. And and the just I don't know. There's something the same as with old cars. There's something about old guitars, the the stories that come with them, the lacquer checking. I like the idea, and I've said this loads on our podcast, but I like the idea of it being a fight. I don't. I feel like new guitars and and the way that new players play. This makes me sound super old, but people like Pliny, for it or Pliny, for example, you know, with his Strandberg neural DSP plugins, like you know, he brings a laptop and his guitar to a show, I, and you know, his action is right up against the neck. I kind of feel like I I bet you're an Xbox player as well, aren't you, or whatever the latest PlayStation is? And I bet that's where your guitar playing comes from—is just sitting alone in your bedroom. And because it's that's what it is—it's pressing buttons on a controller to you. That's what the guitar has become. It's just this MIDI device essentially. Whereas when you when you get kind of I sound I sound very aggressive and real. I really I don't mind that stuff. I'm just saying from my perspective, I'm like, wouldn't it be great if it's a wrestle? If it's a fight? If you're like fighting that guitar to get the best notes out of it? Like that's how rock and roll started people didn't have all these things i appreciate the you know the hypocrisy of being someone who uses helix but but you know the proper old rock and roll had high action and and bad intonation and it didn't make it any less awesome like and and it applies to every instrument you know i'd I love Nick Cave. I love the Rolling Stones. I love out of tune vocals. I love it when the vocalist has gone for feel over technicality, and that applies to every instrument. Um, I, you know, I'd, I would always rather have something be a little bit, a little bit lazy. I'm told that, you know, that I, I'm a bit too much like that whenever I'm recording because I'll be like, yeah, this bass part's fine, and everyone's like, you know, it really isn't. You, you need to redo this, but, but. There, there. That's my that's my my view on kind of vintage stuff. I like that it's a wrestling match to get the mm. most out of them. I love the clang and the splutter of vintage guitars. I don't think there's anything like it. I uh, see, and I agree. And it's and I refuse to use the term contradiction. It's a dichotomy. It's like this weird dual living that we do because, like, for example. Um, in your most recent podcast, I remember you were talking about using your Helix to generate bass notes on a pedal board at a gig. And it's like, yeah. it's like you can, you can do both, but it's like, it needs to be, there's some character in playing those instruments that aren't perfect. And there's a character in not being perfect, uh, yeah. that I really, really like, for example, uh, listeners can't see, but YouTube can see, I've got two bases on the wall behind me. These are my only two bases. Uh, one is a an 04 Highway 1 P-Bass that I have Very added nice. 
um I added the the covers and I added the, the, the bottom rest. Yeah, exactly. And I keep really them, I lovely. I play with them on and some people hate it. In fact, I, I need to actually just drag them behind my car down a gravel road because they're a little too pretty, <laughs> real tiny. But um it and it's like I play that bass way more than I play the jazz bass, which is like a 97 American Deluxe, back when John Sir was still designing all those things. Yeah. Active electronics, it plays perfectly, the tone is immaculate. The, the P bass is just cooler. It is just plain yeah. cooler. Um yeah. Same. I don't. I don't own any vintage guitars anymore. I've owned a few over the years. Well, I take that back. I've got one that I've been working on. Um, that I'm pretty sure is a Gretsch prototype, but I can't actually confirm mm. that. Um, it's 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 a Gretsch prototype of the ugliest guitar Gretsch ever made. Uh, <laughs> like, are none the ugliest guitar Gretsch ever made? Uh, in, in fact, I'm just going to show you. you. You need to see this. Um, okay. This is terrible podcast content, but it's good YouTube. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and describe it, dear listener, when uh, when I can see it. Oh, the headstock's already amazing. The headstock. <laughs> so, so, actually, the headstock is the one thing that keeps me from knowing whether it's a Gretsch prototype or not. Because, now, this body style is so unique, so identifiable, that there's there's only one person who's ever made anything that looks anything like it. But their headstock's different. That's what makes me think maybe it was a prototype. Um, it doesn't have strings on it or a bridge because I had to order a new bridge because I decided to I decided to refinish and redo this guitar myself before I realized that it might be a prototype. So we'll start with the headstock. It's like wow, an I love honest, it. It's an honest to goodness hockey stick. Like yeah, it's a proper hockey stick, but not in a metal way. In, right. in kind of a in kind of a I I didn't have a proper router to do this sort of way. But <laughs> yeah, but and, it, and it, rem it reminds me of McMull. Do, do you know yeah. mole guitars? Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of it. they've changed their headstock recently because I think they used to get a lot of uh, a lot of stick for their headstock because it did look like that and they yeah. were like four grand guitars. But I was a big fan. I always thought it looked lovely. I love the idea that they took something as simple as that sort of hockey stick headstock, head, uh, headstock and then um, just uh, beveled the edges of it and made it nice. They were like, yeah, it, they like successfully polished a turd. Which I, I thought was a great job. I think they make yeah. very, very cool. Good. I've not gotten actually to play one, but those no. that I've heard and seen look and sound amazing. So, yeah, but then the body good. is the most like unmistakable, hideous thing. Wow, I've ever seen. That so is, uh, this dip at the bottom, dip in the middle, like the Marauder. Do you remember yeah, those? yeah, yeah. And like everything is at a non-right angle literally everything there there's there's nothing this looks like um jackson pollock designed a guitar or you know but it's so identifiable and there is no other guitar with this shape is a uh, for those of you that aren't are listening um you can pause go google search a gretch tk 300 it is they made a bass version as well oh, really? Uh, <laughs> really yeah i don't remember the model number for that but they made a bass version as well and so I got this. It was leaned in a buddy of mine's guitar shop in Clarksdale, leaned against the wall, and I saw it. And I was like, I, I looked at the owner's son, who's actually, I, I was more, more friends with the son, but it, I was good friends with Ronnie, the owner. And I looked at Marshall and I said, Marshall, how what is that? What is that? It didn't have a jack, like couldn't plug it in. <laughs> it, it had like four out of six strings on it, a busted tuner. Um, and Marshall said, man, that's that's something Alan brought in and just said, see what you can get for it. I said, I'll give him $100 right now. So he called Alan. Alan said, OK. So I took it home. I put a jack on it, <laughs> put strings on it. And uh, the action was intolerable. There's there's high action and then there's um, square neck dobro. And that's what <laughs> fell into was unplayable. So I, I played slide on it for years. And then I got a wild hair that I was like, because it was a natural finish before, and it was like a bad natural finish. It wasn't right. good, and so I decided I'm going to. Well, what's the wood underneath? Is it mahogany? No, it's a. Uh, it's it. It probably alder, although it could right. be ash. It's one of the two. I um, I don't think it's a maple, but the neck is a maple. In fact, you can't see it anymore because it was a bad cap, and so I don't feel bad about it. it for the listeners, it's it's all black now. Um, even even back of the neck, I, I did an all black nice. back of the neck. Um, Lovely. there was a, there was a weird, ugly flame maple cap on the headstock, like not good flame, mm -hmm. like this weird, 
I don't know, looked like bad eighties velvet. Like it, it looked <laughs> like Elvis portrait should have definitely been on this guitar. Um, but so I did, um, I did a refinish on it. And when I pulled the pit guard, that was when I realized, so there's a, there's a, a label that I've managed to cover and save. There's a label in the inside that says made in USA and has a Gretsch serial number. Like it, not a TK 300. It used one of their crazy four digit that make no sense. You know, this, the, the, the yeah, number, yeah, I know you mean. numbers. And I was like, shit, I just, <laughs> I just jacked up what may be a prototype. Cause Gretsch did <laughs> apparently Gretsch did not let prototypes get out of the factory. It just did not happen. I was like, well, damn it. I've actually tried to contact Fender slash Gretsch about it. Um, but because of the changing hands of the company, they really just don't know. Like there's no way yeah. for them. To- so uh, actually my bridge is arriving today. So hopefully I'll get a oh, picture of uh, Instagram once I get the bridge uh, in it. Um, so when you hear this podcast, the picture should already be up on Instagram. So you can go check it out. Um, but yeah, it's it's a wild guitar. But this is this is my only vintage instrument anymore, and it's from sometime in, in the seventies, maybe the eighties. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got. Um, Very cool. Very yeah, cool. Aggression. I'm so sorry about that. No, I, no, that, that is a super cool guitar. I love how it it, it looks very like early eighties to to you know to to me. But it's got that kind of uh, all the angles and stuff have that sort of fifties uh, throwback feel, which. You know, which I think is 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 almost having this massive renaissance in America. Like I've been getting yeah. really interested it recently in the difference between the US and the UK's custom shops and the directions that each country is going in. And whilst obviously you have, you know, there are thousands of variants, and, sure. and of course, because I'm talking about them, I'm excluding any metal or or modern designs. I'm looking purely at people making traditional styled stuff. And and in the US, there's this move towards like 50s angles, that kind of that real uh, Doug Cower is is like I was everything, Cower. everything looks like that now, though. It, and it yeah. used to be just him, I, I'm sure. But it's everything kind of looks like that now. And every new company I say, oh, it's a, it's another US custom shop that are making 50s style angles. Right. And in the UK, you're sort of uh, you're getting this. Um, uh in the traditional side of things, we've we've much less, but I kind of feel like there's a real move towards Gibson style guitars over oh. here. Our custom shops seem to be going more kind of like, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, here's a here's a Les Paul Junior for four and a half grand. You know, <laughs> that that seems to be the the direction over here. But it's interesting seeing oh, kind the of Collings, the Collings business model. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wrong. I love Collings guitars. They're incredible instruments. But man. Oof. Yeah, yeah, they're expensive. They are. They I'm are not expensive. sure. It's it's one of those things that's tricky for me because I think I'm such like a. I really, actually, do care about the brand name, and I think I would find it difficult to hit that price point and not have Gibson on the headstock. Like, part of me would always be sort of, even though you're not supposed to, and it's not a good idea, I would still be like resale value yeah you know that that's always going to be kind of at the back of my mind when you're when you're looking at something that expensive like the most expensive guitar i have is a gibson es175 it's one of the memphis made custom shops it's lovely like yeah uh, no, i, I they, love 175 is one of my uh like dream lifer guitars that i'm gonna have one one day but um actually i was supposed to get one back in uh, december i was supposed to get one but well, last year, we'll say last year, because I had said forever that for my 40th birthday, I'm 40, I turned 40 in December. Um, I had already said that I, for my 40th birthday, I wanted a 175 or an L5, either one oh, or sure. the other. Oh, yeah. two, two great choices there. Yeah. But then, you know, we got close to my 40th and I'd been squirreling away money for about 10 years, you know, just a little here and there. So I didn't have the full cost of one. I knew I was going to have to uh, finance or sell something or do, you know. Right. And I was like, and I got real close to it. And then I did that thing that we do all the time uh, where we're like, oh, I know I want this. Oh, but this, you know, it's, <laughs> and, so, and I decided I, I decided to order a Novo and I got a Novo oh, instead for my yeah. I, I don't regret that decision. But another brand part of exactly what I was saying about yeah, that. No, it's the, exactly the- what you're saying. And it's like everything that's being like, 
I, man, I really wish I could remember if it was on your podcast or another one. I listen to a lot of gear podcasts. I've listened to a lot of musician podcasts and songwriter podcasts. I listen to more podcasting than I do music these days, and I need to stop <laughs> that. I need to switch that back. But, you need to reset um, that balance. Yeah, exactly. But they were talking about how American uh, custom shop makers, whether that be Fender Custom Shop or like the, the niche Novos and Cowers and Bilts and those kind of companies, the American uh, boutique makers are developing sort of a style. They have their own yeah. style now where you can identify an American. It's like, like you said, it's that weird, like 50s American, um, early 60s, but it's got a ton of influence from those Japanese guitars. Yeah, it's all angles. Like everything's them. an angle. You yeah. know, everything's a, it's a big offset thing, isn't it? And um, yeah. It's like the resurgence of, and let's see if I can, uh, Epiphone Firebird. I bought that Epiphone Firebird, which, by the way, I'm with you. It sort of breaks my heart that that doesn't say Gibson at the top of it. But um, it's it's such a killer guitar that I, 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 you know, I couldn't justify the $800 difference between the brand new Epiphone inspired by Gibson and getting an actual Firebird, like a used one. One of the one of the guitars I regret not buying the most is um, the Epiphone Joe Bonamassa Firebird One, the uh, wow. the the single pickup. They did it in they did it in two great colors. They did it in gold and they did it in sunburst, and both of them looked incredible. I have no idea why I didn't buy one at the time. I think I was like right on the sort of like yeah I might. And now can you find them anywhere? No, because no anyone way. who's bought them they're keeping hold of them because those guitars are great. And they were, I, I can't remember. They were like 700 quid, something like that, 700, uh, you know, GBP. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whatever. You know, like still nine, $900 American, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it was, I was talking and it's, it's wild to see the resurgence of things like the firebird. I've seen a resurgence of the Explorer here lately. That's starting to like catch a little steam. Mm -hmm. I've seen more people interested in them. Um, all the, all the offset styles, um, I was, uh, I got a, a buddy, Desmond, who was on the podcast a few, like many episodes ago. Uh, he, he does guitar tech work. He did guitar tech work for Cage the Elephant. Uh, at one, like in 2020, he was hired. He was supposed to be the guitar tech for Gary Clark's next tour that got canceled. So oh, he cool. hasn't been on the road, but he's a, he's a killer guitar uh, tech and, and repair guy. I don't want to call him Luthier because he doesn't build his own guitars, but he's, his skills up there, right? And like he taunts me every day on his Facebook page and his Instagram because he'll post whatever it is he's working on that day. And some days it's something he's bought to fix and sell. And sometimes it's something he's just fixing for somebody. But one he sold recently. I'm assuming he sold it because it's not on reverb anymore, but was an 82 Firebird that he had refinished. Hey, he had to refinish it um, because the finish was completely trashed. But he refinished it in all gold and then had it professionally relicked to still look its age. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll send you pictures. It is very cool. It, was un, it is the coolest guitar I've ever seen, period. Yeah, and so, definitely. yeah, that style is there. Everybody's into it. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. So, um, but I'm with you. So. I, I also I'm an unapologetic Gibson and Fender fan. I know that's unpopular. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> like the trash. Can't on be them. both. Yeah, I, I don't I don't give a shit. I like them both. <laughs> um, uh, I don't I don't think you I don't think you're a guitar player until you have both a Les Paul and a Telecaster. I mean you're not you're not doing it right if you don't have both. So yeah. uh, that's that's gonna make some people mad at me. I'm sorry, but sorry not sorry. You know how it is. Um, so. Going into that though, you um you're the first bassist I've had on this podcast. First like hey. full time bassist. That's your main gig. That's your main thing you do. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have a pretty you this is this is weird to say. I'm trying to figure out the right way to say it. you have sort of a guitarist sensibility when it comes to like your pedal board and the way you treat bass. Like you right. want so many textures or tone. As somebody who plays bass, I'm with you on the traditional. I mean I play a jazz bass and a P bass into an SVT classic. I mean, and <laughs> that, I mean that's it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even have a smaller cab. I want a smaller cab. I just haven't gotten one. I've only got an 810. That's what I've got. So um, while it sounds amazing, it sits in you know storage lockup for most of the time. So it's like, I, there's no room in this room or you know in my house. My wife said I couldn't keep it in the living room. So um, 
it is what it is. Uh, talk about your the way you approach base effects because that's a whole different ballgame to me. Like on the floor, the most I've ever had is maybe a compressor and a tuner ever. Uh, yeah, yeah. I always have big boards and I always rebuild them. Like at the moment, I'm using Helix, but you know, to be honest, since lockdown started, I've built myself. I could see two others in this room, and there's a there's a another couple in that cupboard that are fully built and ready to go and powered so uh, you know i could I, i'll inevitably fall out of love with the helix again in a month or two and, and want to use one of those but yeah uh, um base f for bass players who are interested in effects is very difficult there are some there are a couple of bass players that um that i spend a lot of time looking at the equipment they use and how they get their sound their tones one of them unsurprisingly is Juan El Dorete from the Mars Volta and Big Sur and you know, it, it count, countless other bands. And uh, and the other is Doug Wimbish. And, and both of those bass players, I think, are fantastic at using their instrument texturally without forgetting that they're a bass player, which I think you get, I'm not into lead bass players it's really it's a re i kind of feel like i'm in this really difficult in between area because if i go to bass shows there are a lot of lead bass players and i don't like that stuff i'm not interested in in leading the band i want to be there i just want to make my role more interesting and more more textural and that's you know the other problem is when, when you get into bass it's not like guitar and that's why, you know, I, I tend to be more part of this scene than the bass scene is the bass scene. You want to go to a bass show, you will not find anything that's not made out of some sort of weird endangered wood with an eight piece purple heart, whatever neck and a couple of active pickups and a 10 band EQ circuit that goes around the whole bass. And the, the whole thing will look more like a coffee table than a than an instrument. And it will probably have five or six strings, which is one or two too many but that that's the base scene so it's very difficult if you want to be into traditional gear but want to do more because there tends to be either bassists are either all or you know like you using a traditional bass yeah. a compressor and a tuner so there's it's it's hard but also i find when it comes to effects one of one of the main things you're going to want is drive most bass drives sound bad to me because most bass drives are modern because most people who want a driven bass sound are in metal bands so all yeah. of the all of the drive pedals you get that are like bass specific they're fizzy and buzzy and they've got this horrible sub character but no real mid presence and i just i can't get on with any of them i can't really use you know i can't really get this tone that i want and i realized early on that the sound i want is the sound of a low gain guitar drive hammered through a bass amp It's one of the things that makes the the helix so appealing to me is it has so many guitar drive pedals that i can use but of course being able to create a a, a parallel uh, uh thing yeah. uh, i can i can also have my clean compressed bass alongside it because of course the downside is if you're just going straight into a, a guitar drive you often lose a lot of your low end but guitar effects tends to be my my thing i really like effects that guitar players would use so so yeah like low gain drives are a big part of my thing compressors i love bad compressors like over the top old compressors and that's that's the other thing that bass players almost get wrong for me everyone's into multi-band compression ah this compressor can compress all of your different frequencies differently so you can iron out the creases in your playing but still sound natural well, I want to sound natural for it. I don't want to I, I just turn it off if I wanted to sound natural. I want to sound like I'm hitting the bass too hard and the compressor is breaking by trying to collapse the sort of low end into it. It's that 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 tone that I think, you know, not a big fan of the band, but Flea did incredibly well for just getting that that uh, he, he'd hit his bass so hard and it would almost suck the tone out because the compressor's yeah. having to work over drive. I love that sound. I love how Juan Aldrich uses the uh um the CS the boss CS2 um for all his like harmonics on his fretless bass. It's just it can a compressor can be so musical and I think people have lost that in the bass world these days. They're using it as a functional tool rather than as a rather than as a, a musical effect. So yeah so those two things. 
modulation for bass is, is you know very important and again another reason why i can i love the helix because i can assign literally you know my top four buttons in yeah. snapshot mode i can have one being my vibrato one being my ring mod one being my phaser and those are kind of those are all effects that i love i you know i, I love to have on a lot like i don't have a clean sound on my board i just have three tiers of drive and then all the different modulations and that's yeah i guess that's the yeah that that is my bass tone <laughs> you're also a big fan of the ms3 which you talk about uh, a ton in your podcast for the very same reasons i've heard you talk about the way you set that up and you know it's funny because like the more i think about it like as i've grown up like i've always been primarily a guitarist but like most guitarists i end up playing bass and so yeah. I remember deciding in my early 20s, well, if I'm going to play bass, I'm not going to play bass like a guitar player playing bass. I'm going to play, I'm going to be a bassist. I think right. I can be both a bassist and a guitarist and not just a guitarist and a bass player or something like, you know, if we want to get real heady about trying to talk about this kind of shit. But um, I, it, it didn't occur to me until I was a little older. I was in school. I went to school for music and audio engineering. And while I was in school, I got to play uh, an Ampeg B15 for the first time. And that was when I under started to understand the concept of bass drive. Like before right. I'd played all solid state amps or like the big PV 300 watt 210 combos, which was a, a bear to, you know, two people. There's no, there's no one person carrying it unless you really, really want a hernia. Um, <laughs> Cause that's the only way that's the only result that's going to happen. I remember we did, we did our little mini week and two week tours, and I'm carrying around a, a PV210 combo, which is like if you took two AC30s and just put them back to front, not side to side, <laughs> that's how big that combo is. Um, and then also a 410 to put underneath it. So I'm, I'm 610s, 300 watts, um, solid state power. And it was clean, 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 clean. Never used the drive. Uh, there was a drive, I think, on it. Oh, it's been long enough. I don't remember. But then I played a B15. And I was like, oh, like at like living room volume, this is unbelievable. Yeah. I just want that louder. Like I, that's all I've ever wanted. And and luckily, ever since I got the the SVT, I can get sort of around that because it's got a master volume and I can I can push it a little. Um, but it's like that's when I started to understand drives. And you're right. Most of the like bass drives that I see now, they're not designed to sound like that. They're not they they were built to be aggressive. They weren't built to sort of just add that little bit of nobody hears uh James Jamerson and thinks, "Man, that bass sound is gritty." But it was. Yeah. You know, it's got a little bit of grind to it because he's pushing a B15 right to that point before it really breaks up. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's about that it's about that dynamic drive. And that's the problem with a lot of bass drives is really their distortions. So whether you hit the bass softly or hard, you're getting this, just this layer of fizz along with what you're playing. And the thing that the B15 offers, which valve drive, which is essentially what I'm trying to emulate in using transparent guitar drives, valve drive should work with your playing. So you can be a soft touch and just get some of that, like that, those sort of transient like high frequencies that come through and then you should be able to dig in and it and it just you get that dynamic compression um that that you get from like recording consoles and things but yeah the, the b15 is such a fantastic thing for that but uh, yes you're absolutely right dynamics is kind of the main thing i think for a good sounding traditional bass drive yeah it's not always about changing an effect it's about digging in or not digging in. It's about using your your fingers or your plectrum to to define the the tone with bass. I think absolutely. And and on compression, it's like these guys who make compression, who and and kudos to like it like Chase Plus Pedals and Joel. I love you. If you ever want to talk, please do uh, reach out to me. Let me know. Um, but he does not listen to this, but that's okay. Um, it, it's like everyone who's making a compressor is trying to throw every bell and whistle at it. It, forgetting the fact that the best compressors of all time have been between two and four knobs. Yeah. Like absolutely. Even, even the rack mount stuff, like an 1176, you're looking at four knobs and, and like five buttons, yeah. actually maybe three knobs and four buttons, but I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's like, don't, don't do too much. Just add a little bit of, just a little bit of color 
and just you know bring the soft sounds up a little and bring the the big sounds down just a touch and you're good yeah the the dan armstrong orange squeeze was always my you know i've I've not actually got to play a real one so who knows <laughs> if the emulations are anything like a real one but you know certainly when i was using the boss ms3 they had an orange squeeze version of that compressor it was my favorite compressor that was on board i tended to use outboard stuff because i'm very fussy with compression but certainly that was the best one on the boss ms3 because it was the worst one in many ways like right. it was the the simplest the one that gave you the least control and the most things that were just set like one of my favorite standalone kind of new compressors uh was a, a french company called anna sounds and yeah. they made a pedal called the lazy comp which is just a single control compressor and they've set everything else in there your attack your threshold your ratio is done it's just a blend that's the control and i loved that because you you can change it internally but i just loved that it it was quite over the top and it was just it meant that things will go wrong because right you know you, 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 you have parameters exactly and i, I love that i love that a lot it's funny you're talking about the orange squeezer uh, and the Dan Armstrong. And well, it's funny. I don't know why I made this like connection in my head, but since it came to my head, I have to say it out loud. So listeners, you get to listen to it. Um, I wonder if someday, maybe, maybe past my lifespan, unless Josh Scott finds a way to preserve every old pedal of all time for eternity in a vault somewhere. Um, we're ever going to go the way of the banana with certain pedals. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard this. Some people have like, the reason banana flavored things don't taste like bananas anymore is because the species of banana we used to create artificial banana flavor doesn't exist anymore. We use a different species entirely of banana for what you buy at the store compared to what the artificial flavor is. So I wonder if we're ever going to get to a point where like everyone's impression of the orange squeezer is what they got on an MS3 or on a Helix and no one's ever actually heard the original pedal anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you, you know, you're probably right. I mean, as much as, you know, I love the, the, the line six helix, the, uh, and I appreciate that this is almost what I'm saying is wrong because they certainly did model everything off of real world pedals, but their VB2, their boss vibrato on the helix, which is called the bubble vibrato sounds yeah. to my ear, nothing like a VB2 at all. Like to the extent that, cause it's such an essential part of my setup i use the send and return to put a real vb2 into the into the helix rig just because it's it's worlds apart and yeah. so yeah i i kind of I, I i i imagine you're right and that we will be at some point in the future you know when when plugins when everything is just turning up with a laptop well it won't be a laptop will it, it will be like it will be built into our forearms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we won't, we won't actually plug into a console anymore. We'll plug into an outlet on our hip that just wirelessly transmits everything to a console. That'll be it. You know, everybody's just because they're built in wireless and 5G and, you know, all that and, and boss metal zones from the vaccine. But um, it's like, for example, yeah, things like that are, are like, it's so different. Whereas like I have a, I have a real Timmy. I have a Paul Cochran Timmy. That I love okay. that pedal. Um, I sat when I got my stomp. I didn't do it with my. I've had the Helix floor longer than anything, but I pretty much only use that for when I play musicals, church praise and worship gigs, or when I play. Um, like I used to do a lot of high school show choirs. It's a, uh -huh. a weird gig, but it, it works great. Because <laughs> um, it's it's quick set up gone. You know, you're you because with like school musicals or not musicals the the show choir stuff you have 20 minutes and they've got 15 minutes of music so you've got two and a half minutes before and two and a half minutes after to set up and tear down so <laughs> you got to move and so and they're timed like if i take too long i cost this choir points in, in the judging process it's it's insane um, this, this this sounds intense. This sounds it, like unnecessarily intense. It is. It is really, really intense. I'm not going to lie. It's it's one of the crazier things. I did it for three years and there's it's there's a crazy amount of money in it. Um, I will come back to that because that's a fun <laughs> point that I haven't talked about on the podcast. But um, but like the Timmy, I was able to dial in an almost exact Timmy tone. I mean, really? Point that I started flipping between them with a friend of mine and they could not tell which was which anymore. Now, 
did the knobs and the virtual knobs line up like at 50% on the treble? Did that line up with 50%? No, it did not. I had to, I had to push and pull a little in different places, but mm-hmm. I could get it almost identical. But for other things, it, it doesn't sound close. For example, in the, the line six, I, I know you just recently upgraded from like 2.7 to 3.1. Uh, yeah. so, um, uh, with 3.1, they added the ratatouille, which is a rat. They already had a rat in the vermin. Well, what happened is they found out that the rat that they modeled the vermin on was busted. They modeled their model of a rat on one where the LM308 chip had gone out on it. And so instead of just <laughs> fixing That's the been vermin. been there since 2016. Yeah, it's been there. And they just found this out. And so instead of getting rid of it, because they realized uh, from feedback from users that, oh, a lot of people have that vermin in their presets. Like a lot of people are using that pedal. So let's not change it. Let's just put in a new one. Let's own up to it. They, they said it. It's in the, the patch notes that, hey, ours yeah. was. Broken. Yeah, I read this too. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I love this. I love that kind of that sensibility about line six. They seem to be so. It, when it comes to the helix, everything you read in the notes and everything like like that is so honest. It's so like they're so the opposite of boss. I'm not saying boss are dishonest. I mean like no. boss are very much like we are a corporation. Here is the product that you have purchased. You can click here. And line six are very much like here's some terms and conditions. You're not going to read those. Here's some effects. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's it's yeah. I, I I I love that about Line Six. They've really got that sort of a, a friendly nature about their company. Yeah, I have I've become an unapologetic uh, Line Six fanboy, despite the hate I threw them. I used to have a base pod. I used to have the the Pod Two Point um, I tried them, uh, and I, I did not own a Spider, but I played a few because my <laughs> friends did. And oh, what a complete and utter dumpster piece that amp was. Um. Like I, I don't I don't even feel bad saying it. But then I bought the Helix to flip. I didn't even buy it right. to keep. I found such a ridiculous deal wow. on it that I was like, I'm gonna buy this, find out what all the hype's about, and then I'm gonna flip it. And now I own a Helix, an HX Stomp, an HX Effects, two power cabs. It's like yeah, I'm an unapologetic <laughs> fan. Um I have gifted uh Helix native at this point to people because <laughs> I I'm such a fan of it. Um so But I'm going to digress. Show choirs. Let me tell you about American show choir culture. I want to hear about this. I was unaware this existed. So what happens is these choirs in high schools, they put together um, these show choirs in which they do things like musical tunes or rearranged pop tunes or they'll, they'll do anything. Think Glee. Seriously, think the TV show Glee, which I've right. never seen an episode of, but that's what I'm told that it's exactly like. Um, with 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 less production, obviously, but they put together these big shows. I'm talking the show. One of the shows I did, we're talking 15 minutes of music, had flying risers, TV screens to project certain effects. You had to bring all this in. You had to bring in um, big trusses on wheels. Um, Bands that thankfully drums are, are you know how usually house drums, um, but uh, and they have twenty minutes to perform fifteen minutes of music. Um, it, it all flows into another. Uh, they're rearranged. It's you know if if you don't read music, this is not the gig for you. Uh, just throwing it out there. <laughs> it's it's not a fun one to try to ad lib uh, or to just try to do it by ear. Uh, but it's hyper stressful. There's costume changes in fifteen minutes. <laughs> it's the most wow, ridiculous. That's impressive. And these and so these bands typically have parent groups that voluntarily fundraise and fund these groups. So there's money available to pay band members cuz most schools don't have most high schools don't have enough or consistently students who are skilled enough to play this music enough for the choir to sing to. Right. So they start and some 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 use tracks um, they've discovered that the ones who have bands typically do better for some reason. <laughs> uh, they have live bands. Uh, so they get live bands. And we're making like a hundred bucks for 15 minutes of music. And the the beauty is they're all competing at these same locations. So like this and the season is about eight weeks long. 
And so they'll all go to this same high school to compete in this competition. And then they'll all go to this next high school the next week and compete again and so on and so forth. They'll perform at this community college in a competition. Um, and you can get on, like I was playing with four different choirs at any given time. So for roughly an hour's worth of music and a Saturday morning, I made 400 bucks. Nice. I had a buddy of mine playing with 11 choirs a week. So <laughs> he would clear. Uh, this is a nine, proper racket. Yeah. He'd clear nine grand in eight weeks just playing for these choirs. It's, it's insane. It's it. There's so much money in it's this. The, the hidden world of playing for school choirs, right? There. Absolutely. People don't realize that there is money. Like when people think of pro musicians, they keep thinking of these big festival stages and that's what you didn't know. No, the ones making money are those taking every little <laughs> gig they can and finding every fucking angle they can make <laughs> to make a little extra money. And it's, and it's wild, uh, but it's a good gig. If you can get it, I highly recommend it to people. It made me a better musician. It, it yeah, really did. Um, that's the thing like cover stuff like that especially like rearranged covers and things like that they'll always you know they might not be fun but they're a great way to kind of push yourself without almost realizing that that's what you're doing great way that great place to learn new tricks is learning songs you wouldn't necessarily learn yeah and it's and it's high pressure because mm -hmm. you're responsible for somebody else like how they do of and course. Something. Oh, so, yeah yeah absolutely it's super high pressure. It's like, pl it's like playing, it's small scale playing musicals, which I've also done, which is also super stressful, uh, to be really honest as I read music, I'm not a great music reader. Uh, and, and, and I love when I get these gigs and they like, they get me the sheet music two days before. And I'm like, <laughs> you really need to give me more time. I'm like, I'm pushing for the score a month ahead because I'm like, yeah. I really need to look this over. I mean, that's a sensible amount of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Until, uh, like, I played, uh, we did Mamma Mia, which is all ABBA tunes, uh, tons of guitar, way more guitar than I've ever played in a musical. And they they got the score to me with five days before the first rehearsal. And I'm like, you realize this is going to be shit at the first rehearsal, right? I'm just letting you know, this is going to be, there's no way. So, Oh, it is what it is. I just relived the stress personally just then. <laughs> it all came over me. Um, wow. wow. But Joe, we, we've we're, we've crossed the hour mark. And and like you, I don't want to push it much longer. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on, taking some time. You talked about how you like to uh, get on bills with bands bigger than you. It's what I'm doing right now. I'm just getting on, <laughs> on, on the bill with a podcast bigger than mine. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this is episode 20. Uh, I don't know if I thought yes. I'd make it 20, but yeah. So you get a nice round number. Nice. Thank uh, you. Thank you. So 20 season one, episode 20. Thank uh, you. Follow. Always season it. Always yeah. season it. it. You can constantly reinvent and refresh. Yes, it's, that's exactly what I'm doing. I think I'm going to do yearly seasons, though. I think I'm going to push it that long. Nice. At least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's all we've got for today. Y'all be sure to click the links below. We're going. Uh, I'll have all the links. It's either in the the YouTube description below here. Some I'm not going to try to do that crap. Um, or you know, podcast notes. Um, make sure you follow Joe on all the socials. Make sure you follow Guitar Nerds and Poly Nerd uh, Poly Nerds Poly Nerds Poly Nerds and Guitar Math on uh, all the appropriate channels. <laughs> yes, please follow all of those on all of the appropriate socials. Uh, again, you can follow us, uh, we're wherever you leave, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, make sure you leave a review and tell your friends and, uh, give us a rating that helps us find other listeners. Uh, make sure you share us and subscribe on, uh, YouTube that also helps us find other viewers. Uh, hopefully I'll have some demos up soon. I've been fighting syncing issues with video, so I haven't posted any up, uh, cause I'm just not good at video editing. Y'all, I, I didn't go to school for this. This is going to take a while. <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate Joe. appreciate all of you listening. Please take some time. Uh, be good to yourself. Be kind of each to each other and uh, make some noise. Adios.